Good morning. Uh, my name is Human Haddad, and I'm here to tell you how the United Nations World Food Program is using Ethereum to distribute aid to refugees. The WFP's mission is to end hunger, and uh, traditionally this has been simple. Where people are hungry, we bring food uh, in kind, like corn, rice, and so on and so forth, and we give it to them so they can eat. Um, for a few years now, we've also been doing something what's called cash-based interventions, which means that instead of giving people food in kind, we give them the means to purchase their own food. And um, this can take the form of bank cards, mobile money, e-vouchers, and so on and so forth. And uh, the idea behind it is that the beneficiary is in the best position to make their own purchasing decisions. So that um, essentially, uh, you know, instead of saying, okay, here's some food, eat this, they can make their own choice, and there's an element of dignity in there, and also that uh, it can have a multiplier effect in the local economy. In order to enable this uh, sort of modality, we normally have to rely on financial intermediaries such as banks, mobile money companies, and cash agents. So what uh, the services that these financial intermediaries provide you, uh, falls under two broad categories. One is practically accounting, which is creating accounts for beneficiaries, uh, providing a distribution mechanism such as uh, SIM cards or bank cards and so on and so forth. Um, authorizing transactions when beneficiaries spend their entitlements and then eventually reporting to us. So this, let's call it accounting overall. And separately, it's actually paying uh, the supermarkets or retailers where beneficiaries have made the expenditures. So a typical setup could be that at the beginning of the month, the WFP gives a list of beneficiaries to the bank saying, here's our beneficiaries, here's how much each one is getting, and they will create the accounts and load them. And we also have to advance uh, money for usually a month to the bank to enable this essentially uh, transfers to happen. The bank then contacts the beneficiaries saying, here's, you know, uh, you got some entitlements. The beneficiary goes to a store, initiates a transaction. The store pings the bank for authorization. The bank checks the account. If they have enough entitlements, they confirm back. And then eventually, post factum, on a periodic basis, the bank will pay the store for the actual transactions that have taken place. And let's say at the month end, we get a report from the bank saying, okay, this is what actually happened. So um, a number of issues that exist with this model, one is cost. Of course, the bank will charge a fee for this, and at our volumes, that, that cost can be quite high. There is the element of risk. Because we're advancing money to, uh, to the bank, and especially in the kind of places that we work, that risk can be quite elevated if the bank goes bankrupt or commits fraud or whatever. We have to share beneficiary information with the bank. They need to know essentially who they're opening an account for. And you know, privacy could be compromised. There's the issue of reconciliation. So when we get the report back from the bank, we make all sorts of efforts to verify the report to make sure that the transactions that they say took place actually did take place. And this is very laborious and time consuming and we can never really be 100% sure. Uh, there's the element of control. So normally for, um, everything we want to do to add a new beneficiary, increase entitlements, whatever, we have to formally advise the bank and they would do it on our behalf. And in addition to the administrative burden, there could be a time delay, which could mean somebody goes without food for a while. Um, we make a lot of effort to reduce our financial risk and also to protect beneficiary privacy, but this also means the contracting can take quite a long time, which again would delay operations. And then there's the issue of flexibility. So for example, if we wanted to do e-vouchers and mobile money and ATM, and these companies don't talk to each other, and we don't know in advance where beneficiaries are gonna redeem their entitlements, we can't really enable this. I mean, the best we can do is you know, divide it a third, 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 or half and half, but it's not ideal, so it's not quite flexible. So um, what we've done essentially is replace the financial intermediary with blockchain. And so what we do is now we load, uh, the, you know, create blockchain accounts for beneficiaries, load them with the entitlements, we inform the beneficiary they have uh, entitlements that they can use, they go to a store, they initiate a transaction, the store now pings our blockchain instead of the bank for authorization, we check the entitlements, provide confirmation, and then uh, at the same frequency that the stores got paid before, we um, know essentially which store to pay, how much, by when, and we make the transfer uh, to the store directly ourselves. 
Um, just a clarification here. We have bank accounts, and this transfer currently is happening through regular banking channels. In the future, it could be crypto, for example, or a digital national currency. But um, the difference is that we have 350 global bank accounts that we use for you know, making staff payments, buying corn, and so on and so forth. And the cost of payments directly for us is really cheap. The main uh, expense to us with the previous model was this accounting, uh, issuing cards, POS terminals. That was essentially the main cost. So um, yeah, just to clarify that, you know, we have our corporate bank account where our bank accounts are, and then usually we had to have a separate bank to provide those distributions, and that's what we've uh, replaced. And so we did a quick proof of concept in the Omerkot village in the Sindh province of Pakistan in January. And based on that uh, learnings, essentially, we've launched a pilot in the Azraq refugee camp in Jordan since May this year. In the past five months, we've been assisting 10,500 beneficiaries. We've distributed $1.6 million, 200,000 transactions without a glitch, and we've reduced the fees essentially by 98%. So that is what that accounting portion costs us, and the 2% is what's costing us to make these direct payments. In the future, with crypto or something else, that could even go maybe near zero. We're not sharing any beneficiary information with anyone. Uh, so again, in a refugee context, that's very important. We're not advancing any funds to anyone, so our financial risk is greatly reduced. We have full control, so if we want to change entitlements, add someone new, we can practically do it in real time, so the assistance is not delayed. And uh, very important for us, we've authorized every single transaction, so we have 100% certainty that you know what we think happened actually happened, and that significantly uh, improves our reconciliation process and the associated payments, so it actually reduces the effort on our side. Um, then, because we don't have to worry as much about financial risk and privacy protection, then we can actually contract uh, people faster, which means we can operate faster. And we're much more flexible now, because all the accounts are on blockchain, we can connect to as many outlets as we want, and they're all coming out of the same wallet, so we can provide that flexibility to beneficiaries, which again, it's, it's great. So you might ask, why are you doing this on a blockchain? You could do this essentially on a traditional system. And that's completely true, we could. Uh, but uh, one of the main reasons is that there's currently a lot of fragmentation and duplication in the system. And this is only for illustration, but essentially imagine if we have Bob, and Bob is receiving assistance from four different uh, agencies. Each agency would have their own identity system for Bob, they would have the contract with a separate bank, and they would channel assistance through each one of these. And of course, uh, you know, there's a cost and the effort required to maintain all these systems, the contracts with the bank, and they don't talk to each other, so that really things are not optimized or harmonized in a way. So what we're hoping to achieve, and actually one of the reasons this exists is that, that uh, the technology in the past has prevented collaboration uh, among the agencies, but it's various ownership issues. So if we have a system and we have a contract with a bank and someone else has something else, we don't want to use theirs because it's not cool and vice versa. And uh, what we hope is that blockchain can cut through that as a neutral, mutually, mutually interoperable, equally owned, all of that uh, you know, open source system, then it's not really owned by anyone, but it's just a mutually operated system that everyone can use. And this way, we can have beneficiary, let's say, identities or wallets on the blockchain for Alice, Bob, Dave, and Aaron, and various UN agencies can link to that and provide whatever service they want to provide. And giving our various networks, like for, for us as WFB with food retailers, someone else might have health network like hospitals, um, schools, whatever else it might be, we can really dramatically increase the convenience to beneficiaries. And if we're all using the same system, we can really optimize and harmonize the global aid effort into an unprecedented degree with big data, artificial intelligence, whatever it might be. And I think extremely importantly is the element of financial inclusion. I mean, even now, without using crypto, we, you know, we, we were adding quite a bit of that to the people who may not have a bank before, bank account before. Uh, but with the advent of that, you know, investments, loans, micro loans, uh, insurance, international remittances would be available to many, uh, hopefully soon at a low or no cost. Another reason why blockchain is that essentially, so we have now, let's say, an identity for a person on a blockchain, and we as WFP are adding uh, financial transaction histories to it. And just showing that you can spend money is not very meaningful, but if you show that you can save a little bit of it, that that might actually count towards a credit history. 
And this credit history now is not tied to a specific financial institution, let's say in Jordan. So if a, Syria refugee, a Syrian refugee were to go back at some point, they could transport this history with them and maybe get a small business loan and get back on their own feet. If we manage to then bring other actors on board, we can maybe add education data, health data, asset registries, work permits, and make this profile increasingly more and more useful to the beneficiary uh, wherever they are without the fear of persecution, for example, because of their origin or whatever else it might be. And I don't think it's uh, unfeasible to think that one day maybe even government IDs could end up on the blockchain. And we've heard here a lot, a lot of things about uh, privacy protection, zero knowledge proofs, and I know it's at an early stage, but essentially this is the path we've just started and we hope as technology advances, connectivity becomes widely available, the price of smartphone goes down. In a few years' time, this could be a full-fledged, uh, essentially, uh, uh, tool for beneficiaries to have more convenience and flexibility. So our um, invitation is to other humanitarian actors who don't have a profit model built in, is to not to reinvent the wheel. So we have notes set up, we have essentially smart contracts for cash transfers, and we're asking if you know, they have resources, they join us open source, free, and dedicate their resources to making the system better, more secure, add additional modules like identity, supply chain, health, whatever, and also make it available for free so that it can essentially grow to be a system everyone can use. Um, currently, we're using a private chain, and mainly that's because the transaction throughput that we require uh, can't be handled on the public chain. But one day, I mean, philosophically, we're leaned if we can ensure security and privacy and all of that to move there so the system is self-sustaining and doesn't even require the backing of WFP or the UN or whoever else for it to function. So yeah, please join us to empower the world's vulnerable. We really look forward to collaboration. This is... Um, a photo from our proof of concept that we did uh, January of this year in, in Pakistan, essentially. And uh, for this, we used the test net to distribute uh, food and cash to these beneficiaries, essentially to illustrate the point that it can be done. And using that learnings, then we've done our uh, Jordan pilot, which is now going well. Uh, it's five months in produ uh, production. And we're soon going to scale up to 100,000 beneficiaries and a few months after that to 500,000, which is all of Jordan. And from there, other countries could follow that have, uh, you know, that could potentially benefit from this solution. Uh, I have many, many people to thank, of course, uh, WFP itself uh, for providing this safe space for this idea to take root. The Ethereum community at large who has been very supportive. The Ethereum Foundation for allowing me to be here today and uh, get this message out. And also, um, Rich Bodo, Rich, put your hand up, uh, who we met at the Singularity University around this time last year where this was just an idea and we had very little resources and support and uh, we told him about it. He helped us think through it and uh, he pretty much hacked together what we used in this proof of concept in the photo that you see and he did it for free. No matter how much we insisted, he didn't accept any funds. So in a way, he gave us that initial push that we really needed uh, to get this uh, pilot flying, essentially. Um, my email address is there if anyone is interested in more information. And since I have a few minutes left, I would actually like to show you a video of how, how the system is currently working. So in Jordan, they happened to use iris verification even before we went. So we wanted to seamlessly integrate into that so we don't change the beneficiary experience, especially if we were going to fail and the system would have to be rolled back, essentially. So what you would see here on one side is the cash register at the supermarket in one of the refugee camps that, uh, you know, they ring up the normal bill, the amount comes up, the amount is put into the iris scanning terminal, the beneficiary scans their iris, that iris then goes to be checked against an identity, the identity comes back, and at that point the terminal has both the amount and the identity of person trying to do it. They ping our blockchain, can this person do this transaction, we reply, and that's essentially the, um,
lot of oranges. Okay, on the bottom right, you briefly see the amount, 1280, beneficiaries scans their iris, transaction goes, uh, the iris imprint goes to the database, comes back with the identity, now it's coming to our blockchain with the amount and the identity, and that's it. I have uh, four and a half minutes, so maybe one or two questions. I think there was one already there. So, uh, well, in this case, you have this iris scanning infrastructure. Yes. But in general, in order to uh, have a established a blockchain identity, especially a long-term one, you would need a, a private-public key pair. And do you have any solutions in place uh, providing people with public-private key pairs in such a way that they can control them and they have adequate security with them? Yes, so good question. Uh, the, one of the things we cannot assume right now is hardware and connectivity for everyone, especially where we are right now. In fact, the internet is cut off. Um, again, we're building towards the future, so as you might know, Google, SpaceX, OneWeb, a whole bunch of people are working to bring affordable satellite internet everywhere in the world. And uh, the price of smartphones is just dramatically dropping. So um, I think by the time we're ready, the standards for identity have been sorted out, zero knowledge proofs, whatever. Uh, we can then transfer uh, beneficiary private keys to them potentially on their devices, and the device could even have a biometric uh, authentication to trigger the private key but for it to be, the data to be stored with each beneficiary and not centrally. Not sure if I answered the question. Yeah. Cool. Hi. Uh, yeah. um, I'm working with a group in Bangladesh handling the refugee crisis with uh, Burma or Myanmar. It's about 1.5 million people. First question, how many uh, beneficiaries can this scale to? Sorry, how many beneficiaries? Uh, transactions, can it scale to? Can it do a billion a day? because we're looking at these kind of numbers with 1.5 million refugees. Uh, the other question is, can it also not just do payments, but um, learning outcomes and then settle with uh, some um, incentivized uh, collection of meals or some kind of incentive? And what do you think, can we connect later? Because it's a Long Def question, yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and how do we become partners with you? Sure, uh, get in touch. Um, my email is there. And um, so on the first question, as I mentioned, we did our proof of concept on the test nets, but we're doing, uh, we're doing a private implementation right now. And um, I f you know, we can handle quite a bit of transactions per second, so million a day won't be a problem. In fact, we're shooting more for more because the WFP itself has 80 million beneficiaries that we serve in 80 countries. Um, and, you know, we've heard over the past few days the efforts are uh, in place to essentially speed up everything, potentially even the, uh, the main net. And so we don't foresee the throughput to be a limitation either now on what we're doing privately or even in the future. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, definitely that's, I think, the beauty of smart contracts that you can program whatever logic you want into it. So, for example, we have school meals, which means that, uh, generally speaking, Let's say if a child attends school, then the child and the family gets food. So it's in a way to ensure children attend school and also that some nutritional outcomes are met. And with smart devices and everything, uh, yeah, we can essentially sort of automate that so that you know the entitlements go into a smart contract in escrow and if certain conditions are met, then they're triggered uh, to the end recipient or recipients. 56 seconds for a really quick one in case there is one. Thank you.